Hello, and uh, welcome to today's panel on judicial deference and agency action. I'm Tom Griffith, and I'll be moderating our discussion. Uh, as a judge on the Court of Appeals for DC Circuit, about two-thirds of the civil cases I see involve federal agencies in some fashion. Lurking in the background in those cases is almost always the question of what level of deference we owe to those agencies on findings of fact, conclusions of law, and judgments of policy. Uh, my colleagues and I are called upon to answer that question frequently in a variety of specific contexts. Rarely, though, do we have the opportunity to step back and take a broad theoretical look into why we afford agencies the, deferences, the deference we do, to understand how the doctrines we apply today developed and to, de and to evaluate whether some refinement or perhaps wholesale change is needed. These questions take on added importance, perhaps, in an age when federal agencies play an outsized role in our lives compared to times past, and when they've been given tremendous authority to act over huge swaths of our economy. This panel marks a step forward in answering those questions, and we're fortunate to have four superb panelists with us today to share their own unique perspectives on the proper function that judicial deference should serve in reviewing agency action, the role that Congress should play in that endeavor, and the constitutional implications of our deference doctrines. First we have, and I'll introduce each of them before turning the time over to them to give uh, statements. First, uh, Ronald Cass is Dean Emeritus of the Boston University School of Law and President of Cass and Associates, a legal consultancy. Dean Cass is a member of the Council of the Administrative Conference of the United States and has received five presidential appointments spanning the administrations of Presidents Reagan to Obama. Dean Cass is the author over a, of over 120 scholarly articles, books, and other legal publications, many in the area of administrative law. He will be speaking today about a broad overview of the history of uh, uh, judicial deference. Uh, Richard Pierce is the Lyle T. Alverson Professor of Law at the George Washington University Law School. Professor Pierce is the author of over 20 books and 130 articles on administrative law, government regulation, and the effects of various forms of government intervention on the performance of markets. His books and articles have been cited in hundreds of judicial opinions, including over a dozen opinions of the United States Supreme Court. Professor Pierce will provide a historical overview of the topic of judicial deference to agency decision making that will apparently contrast with uh, Dean Cass's, as we shall see. Uh, John McGinnis is the George C. Fox Professor of Constitutional Law at the Northwestern University School of Law. A prolific scholar in his own right, Professor McGinnis clerked for the Honorable Kenneth Starr on the DC Circuit and served in the Office of Legal Counsel during the Reagan and Bush 41 administrations. He was the Deputy Assistant Attorney General in that office from 1987 to 1991. Professor McGinnis was also an intern in the Office of the Solicitor General at the time Chevron was argued, and he'll be speaking some about that experience today. Uh, finally, Ed Whalen is the president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, where he also directs its program on the Constitution, the courts, and culture. Uh, Ed clerked for Justice Scalia, was the general counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee, and was the principal deputy assistant attorney general in the Office of Legal Counsel during the Bush 43 administration. He will compare and contrast the views of Justices Scalia and Gorsuch on judicial deference. Each panelist will speak for 10 minutes. Uh, my job will be to tell them when the time is up. Uh, following Ed's remarks, uh, we'll invite the panelists to react to each other's presentations. And then finally, we'll finish with a period of questions from the audience. Dean Cass. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, usually the panelists react while we're, we're talking. Uh, I'm going to start with a, a reference to uh, something that happened back in the 1920s when there were both theaters and newspapers. Uh, the actor John Barrymore had given a performance of Hamlet, and afterwards a reporter from one of the newspapers, a theater critic, came to his hotel room to do an interview with him and began by saying, Mr. Barrymore, before I start, I just have to tell you, your performance was so stunning, I just don't even have the words to say how good it was. At which point Barrymore said, then return to your paper immediately and have them send someone who does. <laughs> uh, he was, you know, I didn't say he was nice, he was just a good actor. Um, 
There are times when finding the right words matter a lot. And in, in government, there are different roles that each branch and each official have to play. Uh, when the Constitution was being created, the people who were framing it were very aware of carving out different roles and trying to find the right words to say who did what. Madison in Federalist 51 captures what they were about when he says that in a government of, that is to be administered by men over men, the difficulty lies in first finding ways for the government to control the governed and following that to oblige it to control itself. So they understood they were trying to make a government that works, but they also understood that they were very, very concerned not to let the government be one that could run amok. And they understood that if you carve out separate roles for people in government, give them separate jobs to do, and let them check one another, there would be much less likelihood of government running amok. In this system, the first role was for the Congress to write the laws, to set out the rules by which people would be governed. And Congress had a lot of limitations on what it could do and a lot of limitations on how it could do it. And if you look at the Constitution, you ever see it as a single sheet of paper, what you notice immediately is that Article I takes up most of the Constitution. The rest of the Constitution is pretty small. They don't have to say that much about what the president does, what the courts do. As you go through it, it looks like one of those old things where it says plan ahead, and by the you have this huge P, huge L, and by the time you get to the ahead, it's falling off the page. That wasn't what happened. They didn't run out of room on the page. What they did was they figured out what mattered most, and what mattered most was for the people who write the laws, who write the rules, to have a lot of hoops they have to jump through in doing it. So they divided up Congress in different houses. They had them elected at different times by different constituencies. They had rules for passing laws. You needed not only bicameralism but presentment and either a signature from the president or an override of his veto. They made it very hard to write the rules. That was Congress's job. The courts were supposed to interpret the, the law and the executive under the president was supposed to take care that the law be faithfully executed, which lets you know the president wasn't supposed to do it all, but he was supposed to take the laws and implement them. Uh, early delegations of authority to the executive branch and to the courts were perfectly consistent with this structure. Congress made the big decisions. It gave out the less important decisions to the executive to implement. It let the courts decide disputes, but it also gave the courts some authority over their own procedures, having disposed of the important questions themselves. The notion of discretion was not foreign to the framers of the Constitution. They knew that people in government would have discretion. But what it was you had discretion over mattered a lot. The executive branch was given discretion over implementation, not over big questions of policy. So when the question was, how do we set up a capital? There was a big debate over where the capital should be. This was an important political question. It was a hotly contentious issue. The Congress passed a law called the Residency Act that set up exactly where, what sort of area the, the, the capital would, would occupy, how big it would be, and then said to a commission, okay, you pin down exactly which parcel of land and you pin down how the buildings will be set up for the government. The big decision, the contentious, the policy decision was made by Congress. The implementation, discretion was given to the commissioners who were working under the president. Same thing happened, you look law after law after law passed in the first Congresses for decade after decade, that's the way the government worked. There was discretion, but it was limited to matters that weren't important policy issues. 
When we get the explosion in government, when we get to the turn of the century and then the uh, New Deal, when we see area after area in which uh, the government is being allowed to perform functions that were never before thought to be within the central government's purview, if within any government's purview, we then had to figure out exactly how much of this was constitutional and how it would be reacted to by the courts as well as implemented by the executive branch. When the former chief executive, William Howard Taft, was chief justice of the Supreme Court, there was a case called the J.W. Hampton case, which came before the court, in which for the first time, instead of saying Congress has to make important decisions and the executive branch can implement them, what the Chief Justice said was that Congress has to give an intelligible principle to the President, but that really important things are better decided by the President and the people working for the President. It really stood the Constitution on its head. Now, in the roughly 90 years since that decision was handed down, the Supreme Court has only twice found a law written by Congress not to have an intelligible principle. So when Congress tells the Federal Communications Commission to hand out licenses uh, to, for broadcasting as the public convenience and necessity mandate, okay, that's intelligible. When the uh, Office of Price uh, Administration is told to make prices fair and reasonable, Okay, that's intelligible. Anything is intelligible, pretty much. This is an open door that was created by the decision of the Taft Court. As a result, how the courts now review what the agencies do matters a lot because agencies are given big authority to do things that were previously given to Congress to do. The Administrative Procedure Act looking at the prior law, codifying it, changing it a little, says, look, here's what happens. When a case comes to court reviewing agency action, the court says what the law is. The court says what the statute means. The court says what the Constitution means. The court interprets regulation. The court does the job of interpreting the law. But if the court says that the agency has discretion, then within whatever the bounds of discretion the agency enjoys, the agency makes the decision, and the court just looks at it for reasonableness. Subsequently, in Chevron in 84, the court tries to implement that directive, even though it's acting not under the APA but under the Clean Air Act, which parrots the words of the APA. What Chevron says is essentially the same thing. It talks a lot about the policy issue in front of the agent. It talks about the agency's discretion over policy. It says, although it relegates it to a footnote, that the courts, of course, using traditional tools of statutory construction, say what the law means, but the agency gets to have discretion. It gets deference as long as it's reasonable with respect to implementing the law. What that meant was, within the range of its discretion, the agency would get deference as long as it was reasonable, but it would not get deference on what the law meant. Unfortunately, the opinion was written in a confusing enough way that that message got lost over time. And some courts thought they were giving deference to the agency on what the law meant. That is really putting the wrong task in the court's hands and the agency's hands. And hopefully over time, the courts the Congress and the agencies will realize that if that's your view, you should go back to the paper and get somebody who understands the right words to make the constitutional structure work. Thank you. So like Ron, I'm gonna talk about the history, but I've got an advantage. I'm, I'm actually even older than Ron is, so. Uh, Although I, I will say, much to my students' surprise, I, I was very young in 1789, so I didn't get an opportunity to, I wanted to hash this out a little bit more with Jimmy Madison and some of the other fellows, but uh, I was so young. I could, and so 
What's the best evidence I've got of what the framers intended? Well, how about the words of the U.S. Supreme Court from 1789 until 1875? For that first century, uh, what the court said again and again was that no, the courts have no business reviewing any decision of the executive in which the executive enjoys any degree of discretion. If you want to check on that, look at uh, read Marbury v. Madison, not the oft-quoted out-of-context sentence that was uttered in the context of a clear command to perform a ministerial task, but the rest of the opinion in which the court said, well, of course, if there was any degree of discretion here, we would have no power to review that exercise. So that's the way it was for the first century. Then it started to change. In 1875, the Supreme Court says, oh, you know, we're going to take a look. And if Congress actually said there is uh, to be judicial review of some action, well, we'll engage in review. The scope of uh, that mandate, that, that permission to engage in review, increased significantly in 1908 and then much more significantly in 1967 when the Supreme Court for the first time announced the presumption that all agency actions were reviewable. So that's the broad brush history. Now, as soon as the court began to engage in any degree of review of actions taken by executive branch agencies, the court always conferred deference to some degree. The precise verbal formula the court used to describe the degree of deference varied from case to case and time to time, but there was never any question about deference when, when uh, an agency puts tens of thousands of person hours into a project, produces uh, explanations that these days run into the hundreds or sometimes thousands of pages, you're not just going to ignore it, you're going to pay some attention to it. So there's always been deference. The deference that the court conferred in most cases until 1984 when it decided Chevron was the deference described in another opinion, 1944 opinion, called Skidmore. And uh, in Skidmore, there's no question, the court said, of course, you defer to the agency depending on the persuasiveness of the agency's explanation for that which it is, has done. Uh, and all other things that make the agency action persuasive or not persuasive. So that was the law until 1984. Now the interesting thing that happened then was uh, the, we, the people, elected a conservative Republican president by the name of Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan appointed a conservative Republican EPA administrator by the name of Ann Gorsuch. If that name sounds familiar, there's a good reason for it. So he told Ann Gorsuch, what I want you to do is look over the policies of the EPA and see if you can't come up with some changes that will be more friendly to economic growth. And she dutifully did that and she took a look and said, oh, Here's one of the big problems. The permitting program is really creating problems where it takes years to invest in anything these days. Why is that? That's because the, the EPA chose uh, to interpret the ambiguous statutory term source to refer to each individual piece of combustion equipment. I am going to adopt instead something called the bubble concept where source will refer to the entire plant site that might include 20 or 40 or 50 pieces of combustion equipment. And that's my new policy. That went before a panel of the DC Circuit, three liberal Democrats, and an opinion written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, the environmental advocates are right. This is a bad decision. I hereby reverse this decision. And so that went to the Supreme Court where a Republican justice by the name of John Paul Stevens wrote an opinion saying that a politically unaccountable judge doesn't get to overrule a policy decision made by a politically accountable agency, pointing out that even though agencies are not headed by people who are directly politically accountable, the, they are headed by people who are appointed by the president who is directly accountable to the people. And say, so on that basis, he announced a new test. 
called the Chevron test. That immediately produced a big debate between two of the most distinguished administrative law scholars of the time, a fellow named Antonin Scalia, who thought this was wonderful. He thought this was exactly the right approach to use, and he stuck with that for at least 27 of his 27, 29 years on the Supreme Court, and was the justice who uh, most fervently uh, supported the application of Chevron in virtually every context, including issues of jurisdiction, uh, versus, on the other side, a liberal Democrat by the name of Stephen Breyer, then on the, the Harvard Law faculty, who got an award for writing an article in which he said, Chevron's all wrong. We should be applying Skidmore. So that debate went on for, what, 30-some years, like every other administrative law professor, I felt the need to jump in, and for most of the time, I was on Justice Scalia's side, though toward the end, I kind of flipped over to Justice Breyer's side. By the way, that's mainly because I saw the way Chevron was starting to work in an environment of extreme polar political polarity, where, where agencies make changes every time the White House changes hands, and I got uneasy with that. Skidmore explicitly incorporates as one of the factors to a court should consider whether the, the policy at issue has been long-standing or whether it's a new or changed policy. And I thought that was probably a healthy thing to add. So just in the last few years, I've actually switched sides in that debate. Now, that debate is very reminiscent of the debate among the great religious scholars in, in the past about how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. Uh, I, I had wanted to put uh, PowerPoints right up on that screen over there uh, that showed the two tests and showed there's very damn little difference between them, particularly if you understand the administrative law doctrines that surround the two tests. There's just about no difference. It's the kind of thing that us academics spend endless hours debating because we have nothing better to do with our time, okay? So, all right, so this is an interesting academic debate. Then one day I wake up and I say, oh my God, everybody in the country is debating Chevron. And, and I say, okay, so, so I, I, I read this, this concurring opinion by this judge named Gorsuch in which he seems to be saying, my mom had it wrong, Ruth Ginsburg had it right, uh, and I'm saying, oh, that's interesting. And then I listened to the, 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 his confirmation hearing for, for becoming a Supreme Court justice, and I hear Amy Klobuchar, the, the liberal Democrat from, from Minnesota, say, it would be a calamity and a crisis if the Supreme Court were to overrule Sir, My view is nobody outside the academy would notice. <laughs> well, uh, uh, thanks very much for inviting me here. Uh, like uh, Professor Pierce, uh, Chevron uh, makes me feel uh, I've been around for a very long time because uh, uh, at the beginning of my career, I was an intern in the Office of the Solicitor General, and the first and really only important case I worked on there was Chevron. I'd like to say I was, I was certainly there at the creation. I wasn't quite the creator. Uh, that was, uh, or at least the creator of our brief, was a great friend of the Federal Society, Paul Bator. Uh, it's not a surprise I didn't do much, given that there was such a powerful legal mind creating the brief. I think it is useful to talk a bit about some of the aspects of the brief and also some of the aspects of the atmosphere of the time, because I do think that explains, and I'll maybe talk in question and answer about how much difference this makes, but at least the change in symbolism that conservatives feel about Chevron, why it was once a darling doctrine, and now for many it's the doctrine of the devil. Uh, why is that change? And I think uh, the, uh, uh, there's a perspective that uh, I think I have, having uh, been there at the creation and still being, uh, in some sense, part of the conservative movement. So that's largely going to be a positive description of why things have changed. And then I'll say a few words about my own position uh, on it, which I think is a somewhat 
uh, a moderate one in this case. So but let me set the stage. Uh, 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 Professor Pierce has already described the uh, issue about the, the bubble that was going to be a way of uh, creating some kind of deregulation and the DC Circuit uh, decision uh, by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So that comes to the Solicitor General's office and there's some question of whether we're going to appeal it. And as I recall, and I think I can say this with some, the distance of 35 years, the assistant to the Solicitor General thought we should not appeal or it was very hard to argue that the better view of the law was not uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the, the, the EPA had been right. It's a very complex matter. The, the source had been used in a variety of different uh, statutes and he thought the better uh, uh, view was that. Uh, Paul Batour was actually the first politically appointed deputy solicitor general, so you did see already some uh, political accountability in that respect really then took the brief over and it's not surprising when the, the law and the specifics doesn't seem to be so great for you, you move to more institutional uh, arguments. And so already the brief is starting to move to be an institutional uh, argument as it comes out in the Chevron case. And I, I would just say, situate, argue, s s point out there were two very important arguments uh, that Professor Bator makes. He makes the argument, well, uh, there are a lot of different purposes of this statute. It's not only to protect the environment, to promote economic growth, and in some sense the EPA is going to have to uh, compromise between these diff different uh, purposes, and that, of course, uh, leads to an idea of a, the need for accountability. And the other argument that actually is, I, I think, uh, in the brief is that, uh, that there's an implicit delegation of some uh, interpretive authority, not only substantive authority, but interp some interpretive authority of the statute to the administrator. So those are the arguments that are, I think, uh, are important to make uh, in that brief. And then let me just step back and describe in a slightly more realist way, that those are the legal arguments, why I think Chevron is received extremely well, was of course at that time, um, uh, democratic accountability was seen to be, I think, uh, extremely important uh, to uh, the uh, 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 conservative movement. It was so, supposed to be the essence of what was lacking um, uh, among uh, judges who've gone wild, right? The, the D.C. Circuit was at that time uh, just uh, beginning to be uh, put back under control. There were some of the most liberal judges in the country who really could not uh, thought to be trusted, a very extravagant of views of statutory uh, interpretation. Uh, moreover, I think another realist sense, uh, it's maybe surprising uh, uh, to the audience now, there was a sense that the Republicans had a lock on the presidency. And indeed, they really never had uh, uh, elected a Republican Congress in a unitary way since the 1950s. And so it made a lot of sense in a realist way to give greater discretion uh, to the executive. Uh, so those, I think, are some of the, the, the arguments that were made and some of the realist reasons that the uh, uh, opinion was greeted with such enthusiasm on the conservative side. But let's look at those. I think each of, each of the, the arguments, the legal arguments, and the, uh, the realist arguments really seem a lot less plausible uh, to conservatives today. Uh, begin with the argument that we really look at the statute as a set of purposes. That's really the opposite of what most uh, conservatives believe, that much more textualist uh, in these uh, uh, days. And there's also a thought that, as, as, as Judge Gorsuch says in another, Justice Gorsuch says in another context, there's always a better uh, answer uh, to a statute. So there's a kind of formalism uh, that sits uh, a little uh, uneasily with the kind of arguments that Professor Bator uh, made. Uh, secondly, the idea that uh, we should uh, suggest there's some implicit delegation of interpretive authority sits very uneasily with the concern about uh, the rise and rise of the administrative state because the problem with delegation, of course, is that it gives enormous authority to the uh, executive uh, and that when you have implicit delegation of interpretive authority on top of that, you pile delegation on top of delegation. And that, is a th that becomes a threat or becomes actually a an engine 
of the administrative state. If that's your concern, Chevron starts looking like a very bad doctrine. Sim whether it's practically bad or symbolically bad, it's not uh, one that conservatives are likely to uh, um, uh, buy into. And then we come to a more realist view. Well, it's not obviously so clear uh, that uh, uh, the Republicans have a lock on the presidency or can't take over Congress. And so that, I think, has been uh, uh, that kind of uh, argument, or really kind of, I don't know so much argument, a kind of sentiment that I think uh, undergirded some people's enthusiasm for uh, uh, Chevron has dissipated. But more importantly, I think there's been a recognition that uh, taking power away from judges and giving it to agencies is quite problematic in a realist way as well. Because agencies are not uh, politically uh, neutral. Uh, there have been, been studies that suggest that the average, uh, mem average uh, career person in an agency is to the left of the median Democrat. And that is going to have an effect over time. Now, it is true that there are politically accountable people who are in charge, but frankly, not everyone is like, uh, will, will, will carry out the president's policies when, uh, uh, when his agency the staff is against them. And indeed, it's almost impossible to do so. Having been in government, you almost always have to compromise in some sense with your agency staff if you're going to get anything done. And so if that's the case, if agencies themselves are not going to be very hospitable to conservative ideas. It seems very surprising to give them even greater authority. And so those are some of the uh, real changes that I think have taken place uh, that makes the conservative movement look much more askance at Chevron today than they did those many years ago when I was in the Solicitor General's office. So let me say briefly about what my position on Chevron is. There have been a lot of uh, uh, strong attacks from the conservative movement on Chevron. Some people even argue that Chevron is unconstitutional. Uh, Philip Hamburger, it's a very interesting book on that, uh, makes those kinds of arguments. I'm sort of doubtful about that. I think Congress itself certainly has the authority to structure as a, statutor as a statutory matter the statutory interpretation of the courts. They can tell courts how to interpret statutes, what weight of evidence to give them, what you're going to have to show uh, to overturn an administrative agency decision. What I find troubling about Chevron is the idea that uh, this should not be done expressly, that there should not be some requirement that if we give uh, interpretive discretion uh, to the agencies that we don't do that uh, in an express way. You might actually think the APA already suggests that. The APA says that all interpretation is to be decided by courts, that that's in some tension with Chevron. I'm not going to press that point here. But I think it makes a lot of sense uh, going forward for Congress to pass some framework statute that suggests that unless we expressly give interpretive authority to agencies, uh, it's going to be the courts that are going to uh, make those decisions in their, uh, in their usual way. They may also say that we'll permit a Skidmore, Skidmore kind of deference. I would make a, a slight distinction between Skidmore and Chevron. Skidmore is a kind of epistemic deference when we think the agency is in some a better epistemic position. It's not, I think, uh, the more blank check of uh, deference whenever it's reasonable, whenever it's, or at least not patently unreasonable, uh, that we give that authority. I think that would be a better perspective because, again, that would force accountability on Congress uh, uh, for giving uh, interpretive authority, for changing, I think, our basic structure of, in, uh, of interpretation, which is that we generally do let uh, courts interpret statutes and not the executive. I think that Congress can change that or can change the interpretive uh, rules, but it should do so explicitly. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I've never before been on a panel with three academics who have all kept within their time limits, so. Uh, I, I will try to do the same. Uh, as uh, Judge Griffith mentioned, I'm going to be uh, discussing the different positions of Justice Scalia and Justice Gorsuch. Uh, I think there's been some talk that perhaps Justice Scalia, in the end, came to a position near Justice Gorsuch's. I'm, I, th I think I'm going to try to demonstrate that whatever, whatever convergence there might have been on some points, there's really a, a fundamental difference between their views. And I think um, this big difference illustrates a real tension within uh, the conservative movement. 
Let's start with uh, Justice Scalia. Chevron, of course, um, was decided in 1984. Justice Scalia wrote a significant law review article in 1989, embracing Chevron and explaining why he thought it was right. He highlighted that before Chevron was decided, there was, in every case, an ad hoc statute by statute determination, which he said was a font of uncertainty and litigation, over whether the statutory ambiguity was one that Congress wa wanted courts or agencies to resolve. And he thought that Chevron was valuable in eliminating that ad hoc judgment at the outset and in instead in creating a, uh, an across the board rule. Now, of course, you could have had one rule or the other. He thought the across the board uh, presumption uh, that agencies were entitled to deference in implementing uh, an ambiguous statute best reflected uh, the administrative state. It was a very useful bright line. He, did, of course, did not believe that Chevron was constitutionally mandated, but he also clearly did not believe that it was constitutionally problematic uh, in any way whatsoever. Now, uh, you see on Chevron what you see, I think, in some other areas of Justice Scalia's jurisprudence when he comes in with existing precedent. He did not, at that time, try to justify Chevron as an originalist matter, uh, that is, as a, as, uh, a proper interpretation of the Administrative Procedures Act. Indeed, uh, uh, as we'll see later in his career, he, he, he questioned whether um, it, it, it was faithful uh, to the APA. Of course, Justice Scalia also applied so-called step one of Chevron with more uh, vigor and rigor than many others. Uh, at, at step one, the challenge is, of course, to determine whether or not the statute is ambiguous. He brought to bear on that question all the tools of statutory interpretation and I think was much readier than others to determine that uh, the statute was not ambiguous, that it spoke to the question at hand, and therefore there was no need for deference. Justice Scalia's big objection was to a case called Meade that was decided in 2001. Meade, he, uh, he was in solo dissent in this case, and in Meade, an opinion by Justice Souter, Souter uh, the, the court in Justice Scalia's views basically abandoned the great virtue of Chevron and instead recreated this ad hoc inquiry, which I uh, believe some call Chevron step zero, on whether or not you get into the Chevron framework uh, at all. Uh, and in his dissent, he basically said, Meade has replaced Chevron. Meade has effectively overruled Chevron by creating all this uncertainty uh, at the outset. Uh, so he, he vigorously objected uh, to that ruling. As Professor Pierce indicated, he believed that Chevron should apply to all sorts of administrative decisions, not simply to uh, those done uh, in, in a more formal way. And he certainly opposed the, the vague ad hoc test that Justice Souter embraced and that Justice Breyer especially encouraged. Well, fast forward four years, there's a case called Brand X, uh, which, uh, Many of you may know this case better than I, but let me uh, describe it succinctly. Basically, the court was deciding the question, what happens when at time one, a court determines the meaning of an ambiguous statute without according Chevron deference? Uh, and then at step two, the agency has given a different interpretation to that statute, um, uh, 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 an interpretation that would ordinarily call for Chevron deference. And the court said uh, in Brand X that uh, the agency's interpretation is entitled to Chevron deference and that the previous judicial uh, interpretation of the statute could effectively be overruled going forward. Justice Scalia saw that in part as an effort to mitigate what he thought were the um, bad consequences of Meade, but he also opined that he thought that this um, uh, Essential, essentially agency overruling of a previous judicial decision was, quote, probably unconstitutional. And we're going to see some convergence between him and Justice Gorsuch on that point. I'm not sure um, that I agree with either of them on that point, but that's one, one area where they, where they converge. Uh, more recently, back in 2013, Justice Scalia wrote a majority opinion in a case called City of Arlington. Uh, where uh, the, the, the ruling itself was 63, but the divide on the court was five to four on basically whether you're going to um, prevent Meade from expanding even further. That is, prevent uh, even more of an ad hoc exception uh, to uh, whether or not Chevron applies. 
And then uh, in his last full term on the court in 2015, in a case called Perez, Justice Scalia um, suggested that Chevron is incompatible with the APA. In that case, he rejected uh, our deference, deference to an agency's interpretation of its own regulations, but he did not go so far there as to say that he was calling Chevron uh, into question. But again, the key thing I want to emphasize here is that his opposition was to what, how Meade, in his view, eviscerated and replaced Chevron. And I think his real doubts about Chevron were because Chevron, as he understood it, no longer existed after Meade. Now, in Justice Gorsuch, in his uh, concurrence in Gutierrez, Brizuela, uh, he took the position that Chevron itself is constitutionally suspect, or indeed wrong position of uh, Phil Hamburger, and uh, I believe, uh, I'm not quite sure how flatly Justice Thomas has expressed this position, but uh, much closer to Thomas's position certainly than, than Scalia's. First he said that in telling judges they must allow an executive agency to resolve the meaning of any ambiguous statutory provisions, Chevron seems, quote, no less than a judge-made doctrine for the abdication of the judicial duty. What you have here is a very strong sense of the notion that it's for the courts to say what the law is. Uh, secondly, on a separate basis, he said that Chevron, by conferring or delegating this legislative authority to executive agencies, violates the separation of powers, invests the power to decide the meaning of the law and the very entity charged with enforcing the law. He further expresses the view there that Chevron is inconsistent with the, um, with the APA. Um, and that, uh, again, consistent with his constitutional view, quote, there's good reason to think that legislative assignments like these, that is like his reading of the APA, are often constitutionally compelled. He discussed Meade, but not in objecting to it, as Justice Scalia had, but in illustrating the, the practical problems that Chevron supposedly presents. I think Justice Scalia would say, no, those practical problems arise only when you fail to apply Chevron across the board. They're not arguments against Chevron, they're arguments against diluting Chevron. Um, and then, on, uh, again, on Brand X, um, like Justice Scalia, uh, he saw that as, uh, well, he took a stronger view, saying this is an unconstitutional re revision of a judicial declaration of the law by a political branch. But unlike Justice Scalia, he saw Brand X as following logically from Chevron. So again, I think you see here two sharply different views that have consequences, consequences for what Congress can do in the future. Is there a role for, uh, for Congress to legislate uh, or not? Uh, consequences for what the court may do uh, in the area of administrative law. So with that, I'll leave it to your uh, questions and our discussion for more. Thank you. Well, many thanks to each of the panelists, and as we now say, now the gloves come off. So, uh, Dean Cass, anything you want to react to, and let's just start it from there. Well, uh, let, me, let me first react to uh, my, my senior colleague's uh, comments. Uh, I, I, I appreciate you pointing out that uh, uh, there's only one person older than I am in the room. Uh, the, the beginning uh, of the comments uh, really lay out what could almost be sort of a work theory uh, of deference, the notion that if an agency does a lot of work, invests a lot of time, has thousands of pages of documents, that it, it kind of deserves deference. And I think that notion uh, really is one that doesn't bear fruit when you look at the law. It doesn't bear fruit when you look at the structure of the Constitution. It, it reminds me, we had a speaker at lunch who was talking about how uh, after the uh, financial crisis, Congress found all these problems existed, and so therefore it had to adopt Dodd-Frank uh, to cure them. It reminds me of 1692 Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, the village elders found all sorts of problems. So of course they had to burn witches. What, what choice did they have? Um, and, you know, I think the fact that an agency has done a lot of work uh, tells you that it may have a record, may have built up uh, a factual basis for some findings. It doesn't tell you that what the agency has done is within the law. It doesn't tell you the agency's acting within legally granted discretion. And keep in mind that the exception the APA carves out is for discretion granted under law, so that uh, the, the interpretation that the court has to do 
only operates so far as something hasn't been granted to the agency's discretion. Um, with respect to Skidmore, uh, Skidmore, uh, I, I on a, a previous panel had said at one point that the relationship my wife and I have is that I give her Chevron deference. When we have something, uh, we do what she wants because she says she wants it. She gives me Skidmore deference, which is that um, if she's decided it's what she wants to do and I'm recommending what she wants, she'll defer to me. Uh, Skidmore deference is really no deference at all. It says you give the agency decision whatever weight it gets. And that's not really a statement of what the APA says, and it's not really a good statement of pre-APA law in its entirety because there are other decisions that grant much different degrees of deference in other factual contexts. So um, I, I think I do disagree uh, with Dick on uh, some of the background. I also disagree that it is a problem if you seek to justify Chevron on the basis of political accountability, it's hard to be a problem that agencies change their views, change their policies when the White House changes. Um, in fact, that's the best evidence of political accountability. So uh, on, on those scores, I think I would disagree with, with uh, Dick. Uh, I wanna make just one comment on um, uh, John's uh, uh, description of what uh, went on. Uh, you, you talked about agency capture and the role of the staff. And I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind, that while agencies respond to a lot of different inputs from uh, the executive, from uh, the outside people who come to argue before the agency, they also respond to the staff. Uh, Glenn Robinson, who was a professor at Virginia and before that was a commissioner at the FCC, wrote an article uh, back in the 1970s where he said, if there is any group that really does a good job of capturing an agency, it's the staff. And I think injecting that note into your analysis of what goes on uh, within the agency is a very important thing. So it's apparent that uh, my young friend Ron and I uh, disagree, and we're, uh, there's not much I can more I can add to that except uh, one point on on. My concern about Chevron today in a world of political polarity really ties to Chief Justice Roberts' creation of the major question exception, which I think makes a lot of sense when, I mean, whatever you, your view might be of the Affordable Care Act or the Clean Power Plan, I think it would be nuts to have a country in which the ACA is legal under Democrats and illegal under Republicans, or the Clean Power Plan is legal under Dem we, we need a little more temporal stability than we would get if you apply Chevron deference in the kind of extremely polarized political conditions we have today. So that's, a, that's really a pragmatic concern I have about uh, uh, the effects of Chevron today, and I think that's one of the things Chief Justice Roberts is trying to uh, avoid with his major questions uh, 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 exception to it. Um, I, I had just one addition I wanted to suggest to the chronology, which I, I, I agreed with completely from, from uh, John and Ed. Uh, I, I would add just one other thing, the Obama effect. There's no question that the views of lots of conservatives, and I believe the conservatives on the Supreme Court as well was affected by the perception, and, and I happen to agree with it, that, that uh, uh, President Obama stretched uh, the limits of his authority perhaps a little too far. Um, and so I only had a couple of things I'd add on that. One, one is um, he, he was, particularly at the end of his, his time as president, he, he was losing regularly in court. Uh, the, the, um, Supreme Court enjoined the uh, issue to stay of the, the Clean Power Plan. Circuit courts uh, issued stays of his immigration deferral policy and his transgender bathroom policy. Uh, he was, the courts, the courts were not rubber stamping any of these decisions and they rejected uh, uh, out of hand um, several of his most important decisions. And by the way, generally, 
uh, under Chevron, courts reject about a third of the actions that agencies take. So it's not a just a 100% rubber stamp system. Um, uh, and then I would just add that, thank goodness, we all know that if there's ever a Republican elected president again, there's no possibility he would ever try to stretch the powers of... <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, so I'll just say a few, make a few points. One, I'd like to begin with uh, very much agreeing with Dick's point on polarization, indeed suggests that the problem may be even worse than he describes it and raises questions about the nature of democratic accountability. One reason we like democratic accountability is that we think that all the people will be represented. Uh, one of the dangers, I think, of Chevron is that it uh, encourages, just for a while, not the median voter to be represented, but the median voter of any party to be represented. Because the president, given the way he's elected in primaries, is likely to represent the median Republican, if he, if he, generally, not always, maybe not <laughs> uh, currently, but that's the way to bet, uh, and the median uh, Democrat. And if we do see uh, a policy changing between those uh, extremes, where it's just law to say that's democratic accountability. It's all the, uh, the centrists in the country are really less uh, representative. Moreover, you might actually think there'll be a feedback effect into polarization. That's going to make us more polarized because each side will get angrier and angrier at the extreme positions of the other side. So I do think that is a, a concern uh, with uh, the way Chevron might work and makes sense of, uh, I think very much makes sense of, of, of Justice Roberts' idea of the major questions. I say I would prefer to go back to a situation where we didn't really have Chevron. One way of, other way of suggesting that is that Chevron was wrongly decided, as, 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 as Justice Scalia is right, uh, that it really ignores some basic uh, tenets of the APA, that questions of law and interpretations of statutes, per se, which is language uh, from the APA, uh, is not uh, is, is for the court uh, alone. I would think that is somewhat inconsistent uh, with Chevron. I don't think it's necessarily inconsistent with uh, Skidmore. Epistemic, we, we see all the time courts giving some epistemic deference uh, to other actors, even including Congress. If this, if if, uh, if the if um, uh, the, uh, the first Congress gets uh, uh, some some epistemic deference, even in interpreting. Uh, the Constitution, but it seems quite a different matter to give actual authority uh, to the agency. That seems to be intention with Chevron. I think this, in, since I'm sorry with APA, intention with our default structure of the separation of powers. And I'd like to see us move back to uh, a presumption, sort of the opposite presumption of Chevron, that the questions are for the courts. Certainly, Congress may be uh, free free to change that. Well, let me build on that, because I think that one argument uh, against Chevron is that it misunderstood the incentives that members of Congress would have and, and how they would respond to, the, to those incentives. Again, Chevron merely established a default rule against which Congress could legislate. So in theory, you could have had statute after statute after statute in which Congress said, uh, the Chevron rule of deference to agencies shall not apply uh, under the statute. Instead, we want courts to resolve any ambiguities they find. Has that ever happened? I mean, has Congress ever legislated away from the, the um, default rule? I don't, know, I don't know the answer to that. If so, it's, it's not common. And of course, part of the reason for that is because it's very easy for members of Congress to duck accountability, to punt issues to the agency, um, when the agency then decides things in a way that uh, their constituents don't like, well, that's another opportunity to uh, solicit campaign funds from the constituents and, and have another round of, of, of legislation. You have incentives, in other words, that do not encourage Congress to legislate clearly and do not encourage them to resolve issues. Perhaps the contrary default rule would have worked better, though I suppose Congress might then simply have found it convenient to adopt legislatively a blanket uh, uh, Chevron rule. Okay, great. 
Well, if, if I can start the questions or get into the discussion here, I, I have a, I have a, a, a deep interest uh, in, 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 the, in the doctrine, uh, and maybe I can introduce that by a, with an anecdote. I had been on the D.C. Circuit for about six months or so and uh, was feeling uh, especially inadequate because so many of the cases as I'd go into oral argument, I didn't have any idea what they were talking about because uh, they were so complex. And uh, so one of my uh, more uh, senior colleagues took me to lunch and I asked him, I said, how do you do this? The record is so thick and the issues are so complicated. How do you do it? And he looked at me with a smile on his face and he said, defer, defer, defer. That's our life. And so, so my wife is really interested in Chevron because it means I have more time. Um, <laughs> since, since uh, you introduced the, the uh, familial. But I, I actually find this discussion I interesting as an intellectual matter, but quite troubling. Uh, because the takeaway that I get from many of your comments is that um, one's approach to this issue is driven in large measure by politics, right? And we, we see that in the reversal of fortunes. At least I, I don't... That seems to be seems to be the case, and if that's the case, that's, I find that very discouraging. When I when I first got involved in the Federal Society way back in the day, it was all about neutral principles, limited government, limited role of uh, of judges, and yet now it, we seem to there, there's a narrative that can describe what's taken place here, is that it's largely driven by politics, and that, that these legal arguments are then tools of the of the political. Can, can someone uh, disabuse me of that notion or, well, I, or I can't, I fe I, I'm feeling mugged by reality now? I, I can't disabuse you of that notion, but I, but I think it overstates it. Um, I, I think there are certainly uh, a lot of people who were uh, enamored of Chevron as they thought they understood it when it was written, which was to say that Chevron said, like the APA said, courts decide what the law means when the law doesn't have a clear meaning and an agency is administering a statute, maybe, maybe it, it is intending to let the agency have some discretion over the policy space there within the bounds of mm -hmm. reasonable mm -hmm. interpretations of the law. The, there are certainly some statutes that are written in a way that you know is intended in the ambiguity of the language to give discretion to the mm -hmm. agency. Certainly, when I mentioned the licensing provisions in the Communications Act, that is intended to give the agency discretion over allocation of stations and selection of licensees to operate the stations. So it, it was a decision that wasn't shocking at the time, but for people who want the courts to actually decide what the law means, which is what the APA says, it's what the Clean Air Act says, it's pretty much what the Constitution says. Over time, when you see uh, courts having difficulty sorting out when they're deferring and what they're deferring to, that's what made Chevron problematic for some people, just on a, a pure intellectual ground apart sure. from the politics. Sure. And, that, and that certainly describes how Chevron has been used, but my question is what, what drove it in the first instance? What's, what's the impulse to, to, to arrive at Chevron? And then, then is that impulse changed now because of political circumstances? So. Well, I mean, certainly to the extent you see conservatives now still arguing uh, for abandoning Chevron at a time when there is a more conservative government, a more conservative uh, executive branch, uh, that would be some evidence mm -hmm. that this is driven by things other than mere politics. Mm -hmm. I think there are probably are, in fact I know there are some people for whom the, your description is accurate. Uh, Senator Hatch, uh, uh, shortly before the election, uh, said on the record uh, that Chevron was really good under President Reagan and became really bad under President Obama. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really explicitly tying it to the politics of the day. I'm sure there are other people who think, I think for most people it's much more subtle than that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, to, to the extent that, that the Obama years caused a lot of conservatives to become concerned about Chevron and the general notion of deference, that they were influenced by what they b perceived as the excesses of mm -hmm. uh, President Obama. And, and, uh, but I, I don't think they were consciously thinking the way Senator Hatch put it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, on your earlier point about your approach to administrative law cases, particularly these rulemakings, I mean, frankly, we're talking about a record of one million pages and, and a whole lot of, I mean, I, what approach can you take mm -hmm. other than, I don't understand it, so I'm sure as hell not gonna screw it up. Mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, when you look at the empirical studies, uh, there have been many of them of the way courts react in various circumstances, what you see on, on every court um, uh, is there tends to be more deference when it's really complicated stuff. Uh, a higher proportion mm -hmm. of those kinds of agency decisions are upheld through mm -hmm. application of Chevron, Skidmore, or any other doctrine that happens to be handy. Whereas if it's, if it's something like labor law, where you're really talking about interactions among human beings, I think most judges appropriately say, well, I've got as much mm -hmm. understanding of that as to the members of the board, so I'm not gonna be very damn deferential there. But when it comes to you know, nuclear physics, well, I don't remember studying that very hard in law school, and so <laughs> some degree of humility and deference is probably advisable. Uh, I'd like to tell a somewhat more optimistic story uh, to Judge Griffith. In some sense, it depends on the kind of level of politics, and this, this goes back to what uh, Dick Pierce was saying. If, uh, I do think there was at least a degree of partisan politics. Well, the Republicans have a lock on the presidency. That's a really bad way of looking at the structure of law. On the other hand, to say that the administrative state is a great threat because it facilitates a progressive ideal of government, that's not quite partisan. Mm -hmm. That's an idea about the, what, the Constitution. In that sense, you might think is has a, a political aspect. And given that, I think that is what's driving the concern about Chevron, to pile this uh, delegation on top of delegation, I, I think is much more comforting. The other point I would say as a, a matter of comfort, it really, I think in some sense, is the federal society that's made it much more plausible to be skeptical of Chevron because of one of its great successes, which is, I think, to temper the excesses of the judiciary. The Chevron did see, I mean, if you were, again, I, I don't want to make this all about my own personal history, but I was on with the clerk on the D.C. Circuit right after I worked on uh, the Chevron brief, and there, there were the lions of liberalism, Skelly Wright, people who would do extraordinary actions to uh, interpret uh, a, a statute to say that, well, there was a problem uh, with uh, drugs that uh, were, um, had to be reviewed by the FDA uh, for execution because they weren't safe and effective. They were, they were lethal. They weren't safe and effective, and that's why we should uh, really, uh, and that was a real decision, right? And, and it was sort of, it was, a, it was an Alice in Wonderland decision, and I do think the federal We call that the bad old days. <laughs> The federal society has really changed matters in that way. I mean, uh, we, it's really, maybe things will change back in 50 years, but it's unimaginable to at least have people like Justices Kagan and Breyer doing anything, or I think or really any members of your court doing things like that. And that makes, I think, it much more plausible uh, to give the authority back to judges than it was in those rather uh, frightening years. I'd just add that the uh, pragmatic judgment that Justice Scalia and others made about um, the uh, soundness of Chevron was one based on um, how the administrative state would operate and how Congress would operate in response to it. And if you thought that Congress would actually act to uh, legislate away from that default rule and that that was a safety valve, if it turns out it never does, uh, that could reasonably affect your judgment whether you pick the, the right uh, default rule. Okay, great. We have, do, I can't tell, do we have microphones out there for yes. questions, for questioners? Okay. We have one. We have, we have one. A, okay. We have a mic in the back. 
if you make your way to the microphone and uh, direct your question to a member of the panel. And with this many law professors up here, if you don't ask us questions, we'll ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I notice a number of you do, do not look like you prepared well for class today. <laughs> For one thing, very few brought the book with them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I have a question, Dean Cass, if you think you've heard me ask this question before, but it's about ambiguity. And forgive me if this was covered. Yeah, is this I, a clear question? Uh, well, well, we'll see in a moment. Um, but it seems to me that the, the, these calls to get rid of Chevron don't actually address the central issue, which is the existence of ambiguity, right? Because if you undo or abolish Chevron, you're still going to get statutory ambiguities. Sometimes the best reading of a statute still suggests that someone somewhere is going to have to fill in statutory gaps. Now, a lot of conservatives are OK with that. And they say, well, it's the court's job. And so I guess my question is, but is it really the court's job to fill in those statutory gaps the way Congress legislates today? Very, very broadly. I mean, King v. Burwell is the key example. It's a major questions exception to Chevron. Chevron didn't apply. The court decided that case for itself. Do we as conservatives really care that it was the court instead of the IRS that decided that uh, exchange established by the federal government, uh, by the states meant, or the federal government as well? Well, I, I'm happy to jump in on that. First, of course, uh, you can't force Congress to legislate in clear language. But you can say that if it doesn't, you won't give effect to the statute. You can say it, it has uh, failed the basic test of statutory drafting, so the statute is ineffective, go back and do it again. Another thing you can do is you can actually interpret the statute, and you can interpret it either to say, here's what it means, or to say what it means is that, in fact, discretion over this issue within a certain space is given to the agency. I, I, I want to say one thing, though, about the major questions point, uh, which is one that was raised earlier. The, the way the major questions exception comes up is not really as an exception at all. It starts out as a very straightforward in, in Brown and Williamson. Uh, it's a very straightforward analysis of what the law meant. And simple statutory canons of construction say if something isn't clearly inside the statute, and it would have been shocking to have it inside the statute, and nobody at the time read the words to mean this, and for 70 years they denied that it did mean this, maybe it doesn't mean that. And it's only this one odd paragraph that says, you know, that this is an exceptional case that throws people off the track. When you get to the next case, which is arguably a major questions case, which is Whitman against American trucking. You have the, the, the famous epigram by Justice Scalia that says, Congress doesn't hide elephants in mouse holes. If you're going to make a shocking change in the understanding of what a law means, maybe you should have Congress first go back and revisit the law rather than, than doing that. King and Burwell is different. Because there, the law is very clear on its face. When it talks about a state established, a state, a, a, an exchange established by the state under Section 1311, that does not mean an exchange established by the federal government through the Department of Health and Human Services under Section 1321. It's a different section, it's a different mechanism. And you may say that that's an important question. You may say that that reading of the law, which is absolutely clear and plain on its face, violates what you understand to be the inchoate purposes behind the law. But saying that this is a major question in the same sense as uh, the uh, Whitman against American trucking or uh, the Brown Williamson against FDA cases really is a dramatic change in the understanding of what that means. And so uh, I think to conflate the two is to create a, a very new and different doctrine. Not that I'm criticizing the Chief Justice. Uh, if I might just come in. Uh, I, I think I want to uh, push back a little on the, pr the uh, premise of the question was that there are, there's necessarily irreducible ambiguity in law. I know that's a very common 
view uh, post Llewellyn, uh, but the way I see it is that the nature of law, its traditions, uh, it, the canons of interpretations are a kind of machinery uh, that should give better answers. I think Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch makes a very similar point. It's not that it's clear that one answer, the uh, one answer was is so clearly better than the other answer in a statutory interpretation. There's something to be said even for a slightly worse view, but that doesn't mean there's ambiguity. I think that is uh, to sh to sell law a bit short. Next question, please. Uh, Kyan Hudson from Gibson Dunn. Thank you all for being with us this afternoon. Uh, Professor Cass opened up his remarks with a discussion of the genesis of the intelligible principle rule, and uh, I think that's appropriate. Lots of, certainly a considerable amount of the conservative unease about Chevron is unease about the constitutionality of delegation to administrative agencies in the first place, and I'm curious uh, what you all, and particularly Professor Cass, uh, think what we can infer from uh, the lack of judicial action striking down delegations to administrative agencies, both in the federal courts and, uh, for, the, for the most part, in state courts. Professor Whittington has written a recent article about uh, the reluctance of state courts to uh, prevent states, which obviously have similar uh, tripartite schemes with similar vesting clauses, uh, from vesting what appear to be legislative or judicial functions at administrative agencies. So I'm curious what you all think we can infer, if anything, from that evidence. Let me take a try at that. The, uh, um, uh, my, my belief is the, the, the lack of any uh, coherent justiciable standard that it could be applied, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, and his concurring opinion in the benzene case, uh, Justice Rehnquist said he would have held the Occupational Health and Safety Act to be uh, an unconstitutional delegation of standardless power, and it was certainly a good candidate for that. There is no nothing in that statute that resembles a, a decisional standard that any court could, could apply, and really all nine justices agreed with that. Uh, the, the difficulty then is then trying to draw that line and trying to figure out, well, what's a major question and what's not a major question? Uh, he, he said, fundamental Un politically unaccountable bureaucrats, well, there's a problem with that. They are politically accountable. Uh, uh, cannot make fundamental policy decisions except in the case of necessity. How the hell would you ever apply that to the many, many, many statutes that uh, Ron referred to that have been upheld? As, uh, it reminds me of, uh, I, I used to, back when Justice Scalia was Professor Scalia, uh, I, he and I used to swap manuscripts and comment on each other's manuscripts, and I sent in the manuscript of a book in which I said, uh, there's this new, this is a while back, new movement to uh, uh, reinvigorate the non-delegation doctrine, and I included him among the proponents. And he immediately called me up and said, no, no, I'm totally against that. I said, well, wait a minute, let me quote you what you said in Regulation Magazine, da, 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 da. He said, oh, here's what I meant. Of course it's impossible to come up with a justiciable standard that could be applied on a consistent basis. We'd be running through the whole U.S. code and eliminating about half of the statutes. That's impossible. What I am in favor of is every 50 years or so, the Supreme Court ought to, ought to fire a shot across the bow of Congress by taking any statute at random, it doesn't matter which one, because they all have the same problems, taking any statute at random and holding it as a, a uh, a violation of the non-delegation doctrine, just to remind those jackasses of what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, I'm going to recommend looking at the most recent issue of the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy uh, for the article there dealing with the delegation doctrine. Um, and the fact that I wrote it isn't the reason why I'm citing it. Uh, I, I, Justice Scalia and I were friends for 40 years, and we argued about uh, very little, but uh, we did argue about Chevron and uh, delegation. Uh, I think you can have a justiciable non-delegation doctrine. I think the doctrine that uh, Chief Justice Marshall used in 1825 in Wayman against Southard was the sort of right version. And there's a, a, another piece of it that Justice Scalia contributed 
when he wrote uh, his uh, dissent in the Mistretta case, where really he said, Congress can't give out authority, which is essentially freestanding authority to legislate, which isn't part of the essential operation of executive action or judicial action. And I think if you put uh, what Chief Justice Marshall did together with what uh, Justice Scalia did in Mistretta, you have a very workable non-delegation doctrine. It doesn't prevent the government from doing everything it's doing. Uh, it allows the government to give out a lot of discretionary authority, but it still requires Congress to make important political decisions itself. And, and that would undo some of the parts of the administrative state. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I, I don't view that as a positive or a negative. I think it is a constitutional requirement, and it is time for courts not to shy away from doing things that are uncomfortable in the public mood of the day uh, when those things also are necessary to implement the Constitution uh, as written. I always think it's useful to understand uh, Chevron in light of the massive uh, expansion of standing doctrines that happened in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, namely, when uh, everybody can sue about everything, it sort of becomes kind of compelling to have some doctrine to give some breathing room to agencies. And maybe that's the, the, what Chevron is really doing. And so my question for the panel is, if we're gonna have a discussion about Chevron, does, don't we have to have also a simultaneous discussion about those standing precedents that uh, were expanded upon in the 1960s and 1970s? Uh, I'm tempted to refer to a can of worms being opened. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of writing on the history of the law of standing, and most of it is not consistent with your uh, description of the history. Most of it uh, uh, says that the court basically made up the whole um, link between the case or controversy clause and the requirement of an a particularized injury to an individual. Now, I'm not gonna rehearse all of that, but I will tell you that in chapter 16 of my treatise, I do refer to six different articles that make exactly the opposite claim for the history of the law of standing that you make. Well, not surprisingly, uh, Professor Pearson and I disagree on this uh, point. But I do think that whatever changes happened in the law of standing in the 1960s and early to mid 1970s, there have been further changes in the law of standing that really bring it back uh, significantly from where it was. So I, I, I think we, we can have, it's an important topic. It's one that merits a lot of discussion. Uh, I think we should ask it to be put on another one of the Federal Society panels in the future but I don't think it's inextricably linked to the Chevron question. In original jurisdiction cases, when two, two states, for example, are fighting over a river, the US Supreme Court will appoint a special master. And as I understand it, they don't really owe any deference to the special master, but as a practical matter, they're not gonna sit down and calculate the flow of the <laughs> Arkansas River or whatever themselves. Though there are some exceptions, I can think of maybe one off the top of my head. The court generally just goes with what the special master does, and, and you can argue that that might be a good thing. So as a practical matter in these incredibly complex cases with a million pages of record and everything else, would it make much difference? It probably would make some difference. I don't want to sell the law short, as was said earlier, but would it, would it make much practical difference when what the judges are going to defer to is naturally going to be somebody who has put in that work or you know, has an expertise in the area? In my opinion, no. If the judge has strongly <laughs> held views that this is wrong as a matter of law or really bad reasoning or it doesn't tie to the evidence, the judge is gonna find a way of writing the opinion that says so. And if the judge has doubts about all that and doubts about whether his understanding of nuclear physics is quite up to the task of understanding the 40 conflicting studies in the record, uh, that the judge is, is likely to do the right thing and say, 
I hereby defer to the agency. Well, the it doesn't matter what language they use. Uh, the question, as I understand it, is whether Chevron deference is different from Skidmore deference. And I think the formal answer to that is clearly yes. Now, maybe in practice you have um, judges misapplying Chevron and not, not deferring as much as the formal test would indicate. Uh, I know Justice Scalia said at one point that you know, maybe this whole fight isn't worth all that much if indeed you know, your point uh, is right. Uh, it would be a, you know, an empirical inquiry and a difficult one to undertake, I think. I would just add that I think some of the deference in the question strikes me as perhaps confusing two things, deference to law and deference to facts. I mean, there's surely the case that if you have millions of pages or thousands of pages devoted to factual uh, determinations, I think even under the APA that's owed some uh, substantial deference and we would think institutionally that has to be the case. Uh, I know it's hard sometimes to distinguish between law and fact, but I think that uh, has to be a premise uh, of our administrative structure just as a, be a, pre pre a premise of much of the rest of our um, of law that we give, we, we, we distinguish who should make those determinations. At least I have not seen a case where um, uh, there are thousands of pages of legal interpretation by an agency, although um, I'm sure I, I would await it with some interest. Um, so I have a, uh, I'm curious about the following. Um, Lee Otis with the Federal Society, director of the faculty division. Um, uh, let's try a reformulation of Chevron. Um, and the reformulation would go as follows. Um, a lot of the time, Congress makes big policy decisions and statutes, and it's perfectly okay for it to leave smaller policy decisions to the executive branch. There's nothing improper about the executive branch exercising policy authority, including in the domestic arena. Um, and uh, it, it just can't, you know, exercise the the, it can make these bigger judgments, as, as, as Ron suggests, um, but there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and so if there's something that's vague in a statute, let's say vague rather than ambiguous for the sake of argument to strengthen the case, um, rather than the courts um, deciding what the limits of the vague thing are, uh, we're going to assume that Congress expected the agencies to be exercising policy discretion in that realm. It seems to me that that arguably solves the separation of powers because at that point it's not the court deferring to the agency on what the law means. It's basically an acknowledgement that there isn't law on the point except that um, the it, you know except within this broader parameter and then basically there's a grant of policy making authority to the agencies um, I don't obviously that's not exactly what Chevron says but but what about that as a kind of theory of what's going on well I, I think that's perfectly plausible and also is almost verbatim what the opinion for the court written by Justice Scalia in the Smiley case uh, back in, I think, the mid-90s um, says, uh, and I think it's a perfectly reasonable read of Chevron. It's why Justice Scalia liked Chevron for so long, and it was only when he found that um, others were not interpreting it the same way that he became more disenchanted with it. So I, you know, I, I, I agree that's a plausible reading, and it's certainly one that saves the problem structurally. But it does give you then the requirement that there not be absolute silence on a question, that there not be something in tension with the rest of the statute, that there be some boundaries around it, and that it not be a question of such importance that it shouldn't be given out by Congress to the agency. But otherwise, I, I think that's fine. I think there'd be a serious practical problem in drawing that line between big and small. Uh, uh, benzene, uh, 
Justice Rehnquist considered that a too fundamental a policy decision for Congress to do. Um, Justice Stevens did not consider the adoption of the bubble policy in Chevron to be too fundamental. I mean, there's a really big decision, uh, but you know, what decisions are too big, what are too small? It, it, it's a very difficult line to draw, I think. Uh. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. I had a second kind of a corollary to that. And when you look at Chevron, then you look at it's like our and then Scalia's dissent in Decker and looking at how an agency interprets its own regulations. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about, about that and how that could be impacted in future courts, um, particularly Scalia's dissent was pretty strong in Decker about refuting our and, um, and thought if you had some quotes, some thoughts on that, that would be great. Well, certainly if, certainly if the premise behind Chevron is that ambiguity in a law in, it should be interpreted to give discretion to the agency to fill it in, it's hard to say the agency can then give itself uh, discretion to fill in more by writing an ambiguous uh, regulation. Uh, if you contrast our with the uh, Seminole Rock decision that a lot of people view as the basis for our Seminole Rock, you have the agency writing a regulation and issuing an interpretation of the, of the regulation simultaneously, and it distributes them together. It's as if it were part of the same regulation. That's not a problem. But the agency can't expand its own authority by failing to be clear in what it does, nor can it be seen as implicitly self-delegating. You know, if Congress can delegate, the agency can't. Right. I, I, I agree with Ron on that, and I, I, I would just note that was the, when Justice Scalia criticized Auer and said he'd be um, it's a good candidate to overrule, he cited John Manning's article, which I, I, that was his tenure piece when I was his colleague at Columbia. It's an article I know well. And John said, Chevron's great, Chevron's right, but Auer's wrong for exactly the reasons that uh, Ron um, uh, mentioned that uh, it, it is basically self-delegation and it, it creates an incentive for agencies to issue vague rules, ambiguous rules that they then would have complete discretion to fill in through issuance of interpretative rules. So it's, it's pretty easy to distinguish. I just add one other point here that's fascinating. The Senate version of the Regulatory Accountability Act, at least the version that was introduced about a week ago, would replace our deference with, with uh, Skidmore deference, which I thought was really interesting, and, and I'm not sure it would have any effect, but it's certainly interesting. Uh. <laughs> it seems entirely coherent, but uh, that's not a surprise, I guess, from Congress. But uh, let me just point out that there is, I think, some tension, I think, between saying, well, our deference, there's a problem with our deference, but Chevron deference is just fine. I mean, I think you can certainly say it analytically, because of course, Chevron deference does give certain incentives to Congress. It gives incentives to Congress to avoid accountability by writing ambiguous statutes and saying to one group, well, this is really going to help you. This is and to the other group, it's going to help you as well. And that's a real danger of Chevron. So some of the incentive questions, I do think, are not completely um, uh, different when we think about Chevron and, and, uh, and our. Hi, I'm Sean Callahan. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, the uh, comments that Professor McGinnis was making about how legal ambiguities are uh, reductible according to uh, legal tools, uh, it prompted, uh, it prompted my question, although I'm, I'm, you know, the question is to everybody. At some point in the Chevron analysis, uh, the, the, the court, if the court's affirming the agency, the court's implying a judgment that the agency's interpretation is permissible. But if the interpretation is reductible according to legal tools, uh, how can any interpretation to the contrary 
be in, 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 uh, in the relevant sense permissible. So, so put differently, if, if there is an ambiguity, but the judge, expert, and in statutory interpretation uh, is convinced as to how that ambiguity should be resolved, uh, isn't that the end of the story? How, how can the, uh, a different interpretation be well, permissible? I, I think it may depend on what you think of the, as, as permissible. Uh, I think many people would have interpreted as permissible as being within the realm of plausibility, right? And my perspective is that there may well be, a, may be plausible to interpret a statute one way. It's still not the better interpretation of the statute. So I do think it is consistent. Uh, I, I think in some sense, Scalia is, was quite a bit of a formalist, and I think that may have been the way he uh, viewed, viewed it as well. I, I, I can't speak, obviously, for the justice. So I don't think that's necessarily inconsistent, depending on what you think permissible is. Permissible, I don't think, meant um, uh, uh, that there was only one view of the statute was, that was permissible. There were a variety that were permissible. Some were surely out of bounds. My point is that I think law, uh, in a formal sense, and I think this is a very controversial position, I would certainly admit it, that there is a better answer uh, even among, quote, permissible answers. I, I would just point out that while in the test itself the court refers to it as permissible, Three other places in the opinion, the court uses reasonable instead of permissible. That has always uh, uh, meant to me that they were incorporating the state farm arbitrary and capricious duty to engage in reasoned decision making into step part two of Chevron. That has always been a controversial view. Uh, I, I am happy to report that the Supreme Court on, in two opinions in the last three terms has said that. Uh, on the other hand, I'm unhappy to report that both of those were written, opinions written by Justice Kagan, and when I asked her if that's what she meant, she said, I didn't really mean to make a big point there. And I'm, oh, okay. <laughs> so, but I, I've always viewed uh, part, step two of Chevron to include not just the, the limits of ambiguity, and certainly, you know, source can mean a lot of things. It can't, there are things it can't mean linguistically but also that it had to be explained by the agency. And in the rest of the opinion, Justice Stevens goes through in some detail the reasoning of the uh, EPA uh, in support of its change in interpretation of source. Great. Well, thank you very much. Will you join me in thanking the panelists for their excellent contribution? Thank you.